Experience. should address a data sharing plan. Um, this is true for the NIFDF efficacy clinical trials, um, SIREN, SPRCnet, Neuronext, exploratory clinical trials. All of these current FOAs have this statement in there. Now, if you're doing a small clinical trial, then your data sharing plan may look very different than a large phase three efficacy trial, but all of them now have to, have to address it. Um, the statement goes on to say the data should be de-identified. Okay, and again, that's part of the reason that your sharing plan, if you're doing a small trial of 15 patients, might look very different than if you're doing a large multicenter trial. Um, and it speaks to the time frame in which we need to do this. So um, NIH, the statement does make an allowance for the fact that those of you who are involved in the trial, who generate the data, that you have um, an, a vested interest and a legitimate interest from all of that work that you put in. But the most recent grant policy statement says timely release and sharing is defined as no later than the acceptance for publication of the main findings from the final data set. And again, that may be, if that is slightly different from what is in the original policy statement, it may be different in your notice of award. So again, go look at your funding opportunity announcement, look at your notice of award, and make sure that you're, that you're compliant with those details. So what do you need to think about when you're developing this plan? Um, the first thing I will say is that you should, knowing that it's in the funding opportunity, um, you should include the cost to prepare that public use data set in your grant application budget, okay? Um, we talked in the bio staff session earlier this morning. This is not necessarily a trivial task. It could take on the order of three months if you've done it a bunch of times and it's fairly straightforward to closer to that year that you have submitted. So um, do consider that effort from the data center's um, perspective and the time as well when you're um, working on your milestones and your timeline. Why does it take that long? So there's a lot that goes into preparing the data for public consumption, and some of that starts at the very beginning when you're designing the CRS. Um, I think Will earlier, or maybe it was um, Eric downstairs, alluded to the common data elements. Um, you should think about those when you're designing the case report forms. For some institutes, you will have to show that you are um, the data you're collecting are compatible with those elements, so you keep that in mind. Um, there's a de-identification process that goes on before the data is put out there so that the end user cannot identify a single patient based on the records that are available. 
Um, and there's actually a fairly nice um, frequently asked question document that's available through the um, NIH website. And they recommend guidelines that were prepared by the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research here at the University of Michigan. I've got a link to the 2012 edition here, so you can take a look at it. Um, it is geared more towards political and social research, but a lot of the processes will be similar. Okay, so the common data elements. I mean, can I click on the link? Here? Okay, so um, the common data elements, and I'm focusing primarily on an idea of what I know. If you click on the link in the slides which you have available, there are lots of different subject areas that are considered and there are a number of um, CDE initiatives within the NIH. And NINDS is actually probably one of the most active um, in terms of their common data elements development. They have um, elements that cover a wide range of, sub a range of subject areas, some of which are a primary or a major focus according to the initiative. Some are uh, a little less focused, but um, there's quite a bit of information there. Um, the NINDS quote strongly encourages researchers to ensure compatibility with the CDEs. Um, this is not necessarily, again, a trivial task. So there's 18 specific diseases, there's lots of CDEs um, over a, quite a large number of instruments. There are four categories, and so you may want to pay more attention to um, certain levels of those um, categories. The disease-specific four are what are going to be considered gold standard measures within that disease area. So certainly if you're collecting those, you want to take a look at how the CDE recommends that you collect them. Um, and at least for NINDS, um, the CDE folks will review the CRFs before the study starts for compatibility. So if there's something that they think that you should collect that you're not, you may have to justify not collecting it. You may have to justify why you're collecting it in a manner that doesn't agree with the CDEs. So there's a search tool. If you just Google NINDS CDE, there's a search tool, which actually takes a little bit of time to generate results because it's searching through a lot of elements. Um, but it will give you the ID, the name, the description, and the data type. Um, it's going to tell you what the permissible response values are and the description of each. So, um, since I can't show you these, I'll just talk through them. The modified ranking scale is a good example, right? Um, it's a seven category scale, zero through six. The permissible values are zero through six. It tells you what each of those categories mean. That one's pretty straightforward. It even gives you the question text and instructions and the reference for the outcome measure. Um, so all of that is in sort of a, a tabular format. Um, hospital discharge destination is um, a good example of why you should do the common data elements when you're designing your case report forms and not just say, I'm collecting hospital discharge destination, I can map it. The hospital discharge destination in the manner which we usually collect it has maybe seven or eight categories, and that's actually a little more than I would like, but maybe seven or eight categories. Um, discharge to home, discharge to a skilled nursing facility, um, discharge to the ward, that sort of thing, or to rehab. Um, when you look at the CDE definitions, it doesn't just say discharge to skilled nursing facility. It says discharge to skilled nursing facility with Medicaid something with the intention of receiving zero to three hours of rehab per day or of acute care per day. It's a much more detailed definition than we would normally put on the case report form. And so you don't want to just sort of blindly say, yeah, we can map to this without double checking the permissible values and seeing that you actually can map to it. Um, the data for trials, once it becomes public, is available from um, the data archive where it's available depends on what sort of study you're doing. For NINDS perspective, there's a, again, there's a link here, um, and it shows you a, a giant list of all of the trial data that's available. 
there's a fillable form that you can complete. Here you say where who you are, where you're from, what do you want to do with the data, and which data you want to access. And then presumably someone answers <laughs> that question. Um, for the purposes of NIMDS, in this sort of general repository, the data is submitted at the completion of the trial. So after you put together your primary manuscript, you're working on the public use data set, it's done, you submit it to them, and then that's where it is. If you're doing TBI research, um, it's a little bit different. So there is um, the FITBER system. FITBER stands for the Federal Interagency Traumatic Brain Injury Research. Um, and they have uh, a much more complex system that requires um, the submission of the CRFs at the beginning of the trial so that you can create, um, in conjunction with the FIFR folks, the form structures that will be necessary to transfer your data into their informatics system. And um, earlier in past studies, we submitted it once at the completion of the trial, but um, the new notice of awards that we received have us periodically submitting the data to them. Um, so it's a little more involved process. Um, before you go through submitting your data to at either of those repositories, it's going to be de-identified again so that the end user cannot identify an individual patient. Um, what that, sort of the minimum, I think, for what that means is that the site IDs and the subject IDs are going to be scrambled. So site 101 is no longer going to be 101, it's going to be a random number that's generated. Um, subject 101 is no longer going to be subject 101. But when you're doing that, you're maintaining the link within each site. So subjects enrolled at the University of Iowa will all have the same subject site ID. It just won't be the one that was used during the trial. Um, you would need to scrub text fields for identifying information or going to include the text at all, which is my really my but um, because it's hard to look through all of them and make sure that there's nothing there. Um, the date and time fields, uh, we convert to time elapsed between randomization and whatever event. So if it's the date of the MRS, we would convert it to how many days elapsed between randomization and the 90-day MRS for each subject. Um, you might add the order of enrollment so that you can still maintain the sequencing of subjects um, during the course of the trial if that might be necessary. There may be derived variables that you would include um, to help the end user, things like that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about reproducibility. We'll talk about it a little bit earlier today. And there's a nice sort of a, uh, commentary piece um, in Nature um, a couple of years ago. And we often think about reproducibility as being an issue related to fraud. People are doing bad things with their data, and that's why we can't replicate their findings. Um, but in fact, at the point of this commentary, it's not usually that um, It's usually lots of other things that relate to um, this idea that we're not training our researchers in the appropriate methodology to put together a rigorous design. Um, the, the manuscripts don't tell us enough about the methodologic details of the design for us to implement it in exactly the same way. And this idea that we want to make big statements, and so we're sort of scouring for those big statements instead of just providing the details of what we need to say. Um, it does say um, that clinical trials are less risky in this regard because we have a lot of oversight already built in process um, and they talk about some of the changes that have been occurring in journals in recent years including some journals have um, done away with the restriction on the method section so that you can take as much space as you need in order to tell them everything that they need to know um, and uh, also including having additional statistical review so in a lot of places statistician might review it only if someone says, hey, this is kind of weird. But in some places now, everything is getting statistical. OK, so why, what, what does this really mean in terms of your work? So for the purposes of reproducibility, we're really focusing on rigor and transparency. And if you're participating in grant review, um, this is going to come up. Uh, and 
this exact terminology is, <laughs> is going to come up. It used to be you could sort of allude to rigor and transparency. Now you have to use actual words. Um, and what that really means um, for the purposes of your NIH grants is that we're trying to make sure that you have thought of everything to ensure a robust and unbiased experimental design, methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting. And that means focusing on things that sort of may have been glossed over previously, right? So we want to specifically speak to blinding. It's one of the review criteria under this um, sort of broad category. Randomization, don't just say patients are going to be randomized. How are they going to be randomized? Um, the sample size calculation, it's not okay to just say 20 patients or, sorry, it's not over 100 patients, however many, you have to say, what am I going, where did this number come from and what am I going to be able to do with these patients? And that calculation has to match the analysis plan that goes along with it. You can't use these two completely distinct approaches and expect that that's going to fly. All of this has to be laid out in advance. And um, in a review that we just recently got back, um, one of the comments was that the analysis plan was not detailed enough for an independent statistician to reproduce it. Um, that can be a challenge within the 12 page limit. The new e forms potentially makes it a little bit easier. You have a separate section outside of the 12 pages. Um, but you have to acknowledge that separate section can't, it can't be too much extra, right? You have to cover the basics within the research strategy. Um, so I think that's everything. It's not a very interesting, exciting topic. I apologize for your, for your lunch uh, learning. But uh, if you have questions, I'll How long after the trial concludes uh, do we do people have access uh, to these data? Is there a specific number of on years before? How long will the public have access to the data, or how long will you have access to the data before it goes public? No, so let's say the trial just concluded, and now I have plenty to do with the trial, but now I'm just specifically doing post hoc analysis. Okay. How long before I can? So um, the requirement uh, in our lab was um, within one year of um, either acceptance or publication of the primary manuscript. It's a little unclear. So within one year of the primary manuscript, um, it should be available. And, and it has to be a clinical trial stock up within one year. Yeah, uh, yeah so the, but the one year time point starts a little earlier for clinical trial stock up. Right. So clinical trial stock up really is within one year of the final what did we decide earlier? Final, final completion. Final collection of primary endpoints. Collection of the final primary endpoint. Thank you. Any other questions? So if the primary endpoint is early, and then the secondary is late. So say your primary endpoint is completed within 30 days. If you have secondary endpoints at six months and a year, so I think then that you would update clinical trials on both the primary endpoints at within that time frame, and then I would assume that the others could go later. Is that what you think? It seems like that would be the way.